Last time we're going to turn to Luke chapter 23 for maybe a while. The end of chapter 23, as Luke is writing, he tells us about, David mentioned about our, uh, about um, Mr. Ryle, uh, J.C. Ryle, writing about the, the burial of Jesus. That's not one of those things that we often think about or talk about. My guess is that you haven't heard too many sermons on the burial of Jesus. We talk about his death, we talk about his resurrection. This was important, and we'll see why, I think, as we move through. But at verse 50 of chapter 23 of Luke, here's the text. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man, who had not consented to their decision and action, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. It was a day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. John MacArthur <clears throat> wrote this in his commentary on Luke. He said, I suppose the burial of Jesus is not something you've considered a lot. We celebrate the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ, but the burial of Christ is as supernatural and as divinely wrought as anything else in the incarnation. In fact, the burial of Jesus is so important that all four gospel writers talk about it. They give detail, and the detail they give is related to the supernatural elements of his burial. The reality is this, that from the moment Jesus gave up his spirit and his body was dead, he, alive, entered into the presence of God in paradise, from which he controlled every detail of his own burial. He not only planned his own funeral, he ran it. The divine, pre-planned, prophesied, and powerfully executed features of the burial of the body of Jesus provide for us some very strong evidence for some very important realities, like the divine purpose of history, like the sovereignty of God in all things, like the authenticity of Scripture, and the veracity of the claims of Christ. His burial brings evidence, proof of all these realities. Paul, as he was expressing the foundation of the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, had much to say about the burial of Jesus. He used it actually as a physical proof of Jesus' death. Just listen to this passage, 1 Corinthians 15. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. The Old Testament spoke of Jesus' death, and because he died, he was buried. The Old Testament scriptures also prophesied his resurrection, and Jesus' post-resurrection appearances demonstrated the proof of his, of his resurrection. That's why Paul would say that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That's what the scriptures teach. How do we know he died? He was buried. And then he rose from the dead according to the scriptures. That's what the scriptures teach. And he's talking about the Old Testament scriptures. How do we know that? Because he appeared to all these different people during that time period of time, 40 days from the time he rose until the time he ascended into heaven. So the, the uh, scriptures make much of the burial of Jesus. Luke provides some interesting insights into Jesus' burial prior to his resurrection, telling us about the man who was responsible for burying Jesus. He tells us something about the motives that were involved in doing that and the acts of kindness and so forth. And then he shares with, with us something of the ministry that this accomplished for the glory of God and ultimately for our good. So let's start with the man, um, Joseph of Arimathea. Where else do we see that name in, in the scriptures? 
answer? We don't. He suddenly appears here, and that's the first we hear of him, and we don't hear about him any other time. Joseph of Arimathea, again, unknown to the readers of the New Testament. Even the location of the, Judea, the Judean town of Arimathea is uncertain. Uh, maybe the town Ramah, about 30, 30 kilometers northwest of Jerusalem, might be the place, but we're not even sure. He was one of those people that God put in place that we would have never expected. Luke offers no explanation why Joseph took that responsibility. And by the way, think about this. I often wonder, what were the disciples thinking when Jesus made those proclamations, when he said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be mistreated, I'm going to die, then in the th on the third day I'm going to rise from the dead, and then, and, and, and they listened to all that, they heard all that, but for some reason they didn't, it didn't process. Now think about that. If they knew, literally, and they should have, that Jesus was going to rise from the dead, what do you think they would have been doing in terms of planning what to do in relation to Jesus' death and his burial and so forth? Here's Jesus on the cross, dead. Nobody's there to take care of him. There's some women who are watching from a distance, but no one has made any plans to take care of his body and now we have this person, Joseph of Arimathea, that nobody's ever heard of, who comes and takes care of Jesus' body. I find that interesting. Joseph was a member of the council. When the Bible talks about the council, it's talking about the Sanhedrin. That was a council of 70 plus a couple of other priests that were involved in making the decisions. They, they loom large in this in, in what happened to Jesus. The council was the one who was pressing for the crucifixion. So they, they were demanding, and they were key again in orchestrating the death of Christ. The members of the council were the ones who relentlessly were pressing Pilate to put Jesus to death. Presumably, when they voted, because they voted uh, unanimously, um, Joseph of Arimathea, who, who was part of the council, obviously wasn't there when they voted. Let's talk about his character and his conviction a little bit. He was, he was called a good and righteous man. He was called by Mark a respected man. Those qualities were all attributed to him. He didn't consent to what the others of the council had decided. Um, both Matthew and John call him a disciple of Jesus. And John added that he was a secret disciple the quote is, but secretly for fear of the Jews. So until he went to Pilate to procure Jesus' body, he had managed to keep his allegiance to Jesus secret. It wasn't secret anymore. Um, also, Luke tells us here that Joseph was looking for the kingdom of God. What do you suppose that means? I, I suppose we could even translate that. He was waiting for the rain of so he's looking for the kingdom of God, he's waiting for the reign of God, and he sees in Jesus the truth about the king who is coming. He sees in Jesus the one who is the Messiah who is to come. And so he comes out of the, the shadows of being this secret disciple of Jesus, and he comes and he requests the body of Jesus in order to bury Jesus' body. He was very brave. He gathered up courage, according to Mark. So he asked Pilate permission to release to him Jesus' body. Some of the Sanhedrin may have been there because there was some argument going on in relation to what was going to happen. Um, here's, it's, it's interesting. The Sanhedrin probably did not want Jesus to remain on the cross during when the Sabbath began. The reason for that was in Deuteronomy chapter 21, Moses wrote in the law, if a man has committed a, pro a crime punishable by death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day for a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. 
So it's almost like the Sanhedrin had no problem pushing to have Jesus crucified, but now they want to get him off of the cross in order to get him someplace buried so that there won't be a divine curse on their land. The, it's amazing the mind how it works, isn't it? How we can how we can do one thing that's against the Lord, and and then in in the idea of doing something for Him, it's convoluted. But that's what was going on. So it's possible that the Sanhedrin was there arguing with Pilate in order to get Jesus' body off the cross, and at the same time, perhaps don't know this for sure, but Joseph of Arimathea, part of that council, comes and asks for the body of Jesus. Now, what's the motive behind Joseph's actions? Um, David quoted J.C. Ryle. I'm going to quote him again. He, he wrote this, We know nothing of Joseph excepting what is here told us. In no part of the Acts or the Epistles do we find any mention of his name. No former period of our Lord's ministry does he ever come forward. His reason for not openly joining the disciples before, we can't explain. But here, at the 11th hour, this man is not afraid to show himself as one of the Lord's friends. At the very time when the apostles had forsaken Jesus, Joseph is not ashamed to show his love and respect. Others had confessed him while he was living and doing miracles. It was reserved for Joseph to confess him when he was dead. The history of Joseph is full of instruction and encouragement. It shows us that Christ has friends of whom the church knows little or nothing, friends who profess less than some do, but friends who in real love and affection are second to none. It shows us above all that, if all that events may bring out grace in quarters where at present we do not expect it. And that the cause of Christ may prove one day to have many supporters of whose ex existence we are at present not aware. Let us learn from the case of Joseph of Arimathea to be charitable and hopeful in our judgments. All is not barren in this world when our eyes perhaps see nothing. There may be some latent sparks of light where all appears dark. Grains of true faith may be lying hid in some neglected congregation which have been placed there by God. There were 7,000 true worshipers in Israel about whom Elijah knew nothing. The day of judgment will bring forward men and women who, are, who seemed last and place them among the first, end quote. I think Joseph was probably horrified and devastated by what the council members had done to Jesus. I mean, think of him. He's trying to keep it a secret. He's a disciple of Jesus. He's on this council, and they make this proclamation to have Jesus put to death. He's horrified by that. What's he do as one person on the council? The noblest thing Joseph could think of was to remove Jesus' body from this final indignity. Um, it's, it's a little unclear what would have happened, but it, it sort of goes like this, I think. Um, some, have, some have debated this, but there was a garbage dump outside of, of Jerusalem, a place where, I mean, we all have garbage, right? Where are you going to put it? So there was this dump that they used to, to put the garbage in. And some would say it didn't develop until later after this, but I think it probably was there. And then sometimes when, when um, uh, not just garbage was put there, if someone was killed or crucified, a criminal, they would take their bodies off of the cross and they would throw them in the garbage dump. Remember that Jesus was describing Gehenna, the place of ultimate judgment, and he talked about it was a place where the worm doesn't die and where the fire never goes out. Well, that was like it was at the, at the garbage dump outside of Jerusalem. And it could well have been that these people who were, who were hung on crosses as criminals were taken down and thrown there and their bodies were burned. Or, this is even more disgusting perhaps, but... Sometimes they remain on the cross, and after they died, then the birds would come and pick them apart. Or they would take them off of the cross and just throw them somewhere where animals, wild animals, would tear them apart and consume them. What would have happened to Jesus if no one would have taken his body and buried it? 
So in the providence of God, he raises up this secret disciple to come forward and take the body of Jesus and lovingly care for it and place his body in a tomb. But there's more than just this outside motivation, I think. There was an inner motivation, part of that I've already mentioned, but again, quoting from somebody else, whatever the motives of the heart that drive the behaviors, God is ordering all of it. Not in a fatalistic way, but in a massive expression of wisdom and power by which the free choices of these people are woven together in perfect tapestry for God to affect his purpose of displaying that he commands history, he is sovereign, the scripture is true, and Christ is in fact God. So I, I'm... I'm surprised and, and interested and fascinated by this man, Joseph of Arimathea, who comes out of the woodwork, who claims the body of Jesus and cares for him. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 9, the prophet Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus was on the earth, said, they made, and they made his grave with the wicked. Again, more than likely, without this intervention, Jesus would have been destroyed in some way, his body, his physical body. But Isaiah also continued, not only does he say they made his grave with the wicked, but also, and with a rich man in his death. Man's plans for Jesus to be buried with the wicked, but God planned for Jesus to be buried with the rich. Joseph of Arimathea was acting freely, no doubt, motivated by his love for Jesus. He was in a hurry, maybe not so much because he didn't want to violate the Sabbath, but possibly, in fact, possibly he could have already violated the Sabbath because, for a couple of reasons. One, he had gone to Pilate. Pilate was a Gentile. No Jew would go into the presence of a Gentile. If you remember when, the, when, the, uh, when they were calling for Jesus' death, they, they called Pilate out, basically, to come and talk to them. They didn't go to him because that would defile them. Well, here, Joseph goes into the presence of Pilate to ask him for the body, and then he's handling a corpse in order to prepare Jesus' body for burial. So I'm not sure if that was all of a great concern. But again, providentially, God is working. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 12 when Jesus was talking about his death and his resurrection? He used an Old Testament illustration. Do you remember what that was? As Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. So that prophecy is interesting because it was referencing the time that Jesus would be buried. Now, I, I realize that it's difficult to get three days and three nights into uh, Friday uh, right before 6, Saturday and by, noon, or by uh, dawn on Sunday. I mean, but the way the Jews figured time, it was any part equals a whole. So Jesus buried before six o'clock when the new day started, that would be one day. And then by six o'clock, um, fr um, six o'clock Saturday or the next day, and then, and then after that, I'm getting all mixed up, but before six o'clock is one day, after 6 o'clock on Friday is the second day. After 6 o'clock on, on Saturday is the third day. So Jesus was in buried for three days. Um, so that was the prophecy. Now think about this. If, if Joseph had waited for a while and it went past that 6 o'clock time, then you run into a prophetic conundrum, okay? You got a problem. I doubt that Joseph really knew that. I doubt that he understood that. Not sure why he hurried so much, but in the providence of God, he did. Now think about that. Jesus died what time? Three o'clock, Friday afternoon. Before six, he had to be in the tomb. Think of all the things that Joseph had to do in order to make that happen. 
It's quite amazing. Let's look at his ministry. The first thing he does is he procures the body from, from Pilate, one who had been condemned to death, again, had no right to a burial. And we already talked about what would happen to those criminals. Um, Joseph, by going, would no longer be a secret disciple. He'd make himself known that he was a disciple of Jesus and wanting the body. And then he had to prepare the body for burial. To prepare the body, he first had to get the body off the cross. He had to transport the body somewhere to the tomb or near the tomb. He probably had help. Remember, Joseph was a rich man. He may have had other servants that helped him. The Bible doesn't tell us. But he also had somebody the Bible does tell us about. In John's gospel, he tells us about Nicodemus. Remember that guy? He came to Jesus by night in John chapter 3. Nicodemus became a secret disciple of Jesus. So you have two secret disciples of Jesus coming together, identifying themselves as followers of Jesus, and they're the ones who are taking care of the body. Joseph got the body. Nicodemus brought the spices. We're told that he brought something like 75 pounds worth of spices. Remember that they didn't embalm, so the bodies would decay very quickly, normally. And so the bodies would be wrapped. And so first they would probably be washed. And then after they were washed, then they would be wrapped. And then the spices would be applied. And after that, um, and probably, I, I've often wondered about this. Uh, you've heard of stories about the Shroud of Turin and other kinds of things like that. And by the way, I think that's a hoax. But, but the way that they wrap the body would be they would take strips of cloth and they would wrap the body that way and inter and put spices in between and wrap the body. And then probably, possibly, they put a shroud over the body after that. And then Jesus' body would then be placed in the tomb. Um, we're told, Luke tells us, that they laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. That's interesting. Um, this was the tomb that belonged to Joseph. It was a tomb that was new and never been used. A lot of tombs were used many times. A body that died would be placed on a shelf in, in the tomb, and then after the decay process happened, the bones would be collected and put in a box, and then it could be used for somebody else. Many times there were multiple people who had been buried in a tomb, not this tomb. This was a new tomb, and this probably was the only time this tomb had a body in it. The Greek text is interesting. You know, sometimes in English we talk about don't use a double negative. Probably remember that from English class. Maybe you don't know what it means, but you remember the phrase. Well, in Greek, this is used, this is a triple negative. <laughs> um, the idea of that, that no one ever, ever, ever had used this tomb. Then there's the ministry of the women. Now, this is an interesting one. If you were here the last couple of years on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday morning, you know that I was kind of hard on the women about this because I often was scratching my head. They were there when Joseph was preparing the body. They were watching. Luke makes the case that they saw the tomb and they also saw how the body was laid. And then they did what? They went home in order to prepare spices. So they were eyewitnesses to the account of Jesus' crucifixion and his burial and, and all of that. But let's, let's think about that a little bit. These women had been following Jesus throughout his ministry. And they had come to the cross where he was crucified. They likely watched when Joseph took the body from the cross. They followed him as he took Jesus' body to prepare it for burial. And all of this commendable. There's no evidence in the gospel accounts that they helped in any way to prepare Jesus' body. But they're watching what's done to him. What was important here was that they knew where the tomb was. Later, after Jesus rose from the dead, you know one of the, the big arguments that says that Jesus wasn't really resurrected? They say, well, the women went to the wrong tomb. They went to an empty tomb somewhere else, and actually Jesus was still in the tomb where he was buried. 
These women knew exactly where the tomb was. They watched as he was buried. So that was a faulty argument. Um, not only did they pay close attention to that, the charge, um, Luke makes it clear that these women were present when Jesus was buried, but they didn't, they didn't go to the tomb um, until later on Sunday morning. Um, again, they had watched as all this was going on. But here's my question. Why did they go home and assemb assemble spices? What had happened to Jesus? He was already prepared, and he was put in the tomb, and the stone was rolled in front of the tomb. Why did they go home to prepare spices? Now, there are a lot of reasons why that might be possible. Maybe they thought that Joseph had just had too much to do in too short a time, and it wasn't completely done. That's one of them. I made a statement um, last Easter basically saying that I'm pretty sure that they felt like that whatever Joseph and Nicodemus had done, they didn't do it right, and they were going to redo it. Now, if I am wrong, I will have to apologize to those women, <laughs> but I'm guessing that that had something to do with it. Now, when they go back to their home, again, remember the time frame. We're really close here. And so how are they going to prepare these spices before Sabbath begins at 6 o'clock? Now, there were some, there were some um, uh, ideas. Uh, we, we read about some, some provisions that were made in times of emergency or something like that. So they may have had somehow through the rabbinic writings some, some opportunity to do those kinds of things during the Sabbath. But they couldn't, they wouldn't be allowed in Sabbath law, to walk back to the tomb and, do, and to redo the body of Jesus on the Sabbath. So they're going to have to wait. Now, they theoretically could have gone back to the tomb after 6 o'clock on Saturday night. But to do that, they mostly would be working in the dark. So probably what they did was wait till early Sunday morning so they're walking into the light rather than into the darkness, and they're ready to go redo the um, burial preparation for Jesus. And when they get there, you know the story. We'll look at that next week. Where when they get to the tomb, what happens? They're First of all, they're having a conversation. How are we going to roll the stone away? And then when they get there, the stone's rolled away. And then they wonder what to do. And then there's the angel who tells them what had actually happened. Again, we'll get to that next time. But that's what was going on here. Um, they're anticipating the end of the Sabbath so they can go to the tomb providentially again they didn't go on Saturday they went on Sunday morning and what happened sometime before dawn on Sunday morning Jesus rose from the dead so put all this together Jesus died his death was essential for our salvation and he accomplished salvation through his death his burial was all part of the plan and purpose of God for the granting of eternal life to those whom the father had given him passage also reminds us that God uses people, sometimes unknown, seemingly insignificant people, to accomplish his purposes. Are you glad about that? And there are people who belong to him that are in places that we would never imagine. I remember reading in the, in the book of Acts about, um, and, or in the book, one of Paul's letters in the book of uh, Philippians, where he talks about the Praetorian Guard, these people who work in the house of Caesar, and they had become believers in Jesus. You wouldn't think that there would be believers in Jesus in the place where, where um, Caesar was. But in the household of Caesar, there were people who believed. So there, here is this guy who is a follower of Jesus, and he's part of the Sanhedrin. The council. Joseph mustered the courage to declare his allegiance to Jesus that probably cost him. There may be a good reason why he's never mentioned again. Probably lost his position, almost for certain. Not sure he would want to be with that group, but probably lost that because now he's a follower of Jesus. The one negative that I would voice about all this was the, the failure of nearly every one of the followers of Jesus to believe what Jesus repeatedly pronounced and proclaimed, that he would rise from the dead. Nobody seemed to get that. 
Again, we'll look at that when we get to chapter 24. Why is it that people failed to hear that Jesus, from his own lips, said that he was going to rise from the dead? If, if you could think about it this way, it'd be like the disciples, having heard all of that, should have been thinking, okay, this is horrible, this is terrible that Jesus is going to the cross to die, but he told us that he had to die. And then he also told us that he would be buried and that he would be raised from the dead. And so we need to get ready, guys, because Jesus is going to be rising from the dead in three days. We need to be ready to greet him when he's risen. Instead, what were they? They were despondent when he died. And not one of them was looking for a resurrected Lord. Not one of them. How often do we read the scriptures and we read of the promises and the faithfulness of God and all the things that God does and we just don't believe it? And we act inappropriately because we don't believe. I also marvel in all this of the providence of God. This, this is the one I think that I'm becoming more and more amazed by as I get older watching how God works everything out according to his plan and purpose to put just the right people at the right time in the right way to accomplish his work. It's amazing. God is a God who has everything under control, and he is a God who brings everything exactly the way it's supposed to be for everyone who belongs to him. Paul was not wrong when he wrote that, that God loves us and that he is one who sets everything perfectly so that he accomplishes his good will for us. He actually does work everything according to his plan and purpose for our good. Every one of us loves to quote Romans 8.28. Not one of us in this room faithfully lives accordingly. Because when things happen, that are negative, we want to say, God, what are you doing? Where are you? What's going on? When in fact, he's working everything perfectly for our good. I can look out at this group and I can see a half a dozen of you have had awful things have happened in the last two or three weeks. And, 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 it, and it led to all kinds of issues and problems and challenges. And, and you could say, oh, why is this happening? Why, why did this? And I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but I also know that there's a God in heaven who arranges everything just perfectly to accomplish his will for, for the ultimate good, but also for your good, in order that you might accomplish his purposes for his glory. The next thing, something happens to you that's not so good. Can, can you say, Lord, I know you've got this... I know you've got a hold of me. I know you're holding on to me, and I know you're not letting go, and I know this is somehow going to be for your good, and I have no clue what in the world you're doing, but I can trust you. Elmer just shared with me, he drove his car into some water and totaled his car. You know about Kay and her situation. Some other you are going through tests and challenges and problems and issues, and you go, what? And, and sometimes we're guilty to say, how could a good God do this? Because he's a good God and he knows what he's doing. And he knows how to accomplish his purposes for his glory and for our good. And here Jesus uh, dies and it's a guy we never heard of before who comes and takes him and buries him and prepares him in just the right way and then when Jesus is raised from the dead even those burial clothes are going to give testimony to the risen Lord Jesus it's amazing does he have control of you is he taking care of you do you belong to him then you can give glory to Father, thank you for letting us see a little bit of this in the Bible, a little bit of your providential work, a little bit of the care that came from an unknown person, a little bit about how you orchestrate people for your glory, and, and then a whole lot about your plan and purpose for Jesus to completely 
utterly pay the price to die, but also to be raised from the dead. Thank you for this picture by all the gospel writers of the burial of Jesus and how important that was to show, to show that he died for us. May we never get over the price that was paid for our salvation, but may we also never get over the wonder and glory that this dead Savior did rise from the dead and is alive forevermore. And so you can receive our praise and glory today, for you are the one who has bought us. We belong to you. Thank you for holding on to us. Thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for providing for us. And thank you that you will never stop, that you will usher us all the way into your presence. We thank you in 